Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this morning's study session for Thursday, October 16th. Uh, I'm Vice Mayor Glover. We'd like to excuse Mayor Giles uh, for being out of town. We're going to, uh, the first item on the agenda is to review items on the agenda for October 20th regular uh, council meeting. Starting with items 2 through 3D. Items 3E through 4B. Items 4C through 4D. Items 4E. Well, you should have been prepared, Dave. <laughs> These are slow today. Just going through the items No. Well, everyone else seems to be able to keep up. Really, Chris? Is that necessary? Well, no. You get one day in the chair. Yeah, I guess so. I try to be. Are you ready? Yep. Items 4E through 4G. Items 4H through 4J. Items 4K through 4M. Items on uh, 4M. Oh, sorry. Was there some additional information, oh, yes. Mr. Breen? Good morning, Mayor Council, or Vice Mayor Council. <laughs> um, we wanted to uh, modify the item agenda for 4M on the Master Services Job Order Services contract. We wanted to make that an annual contract with four option years. Um, it's the way it was advertised, and we'd like to uh, re redo the item for this on the Council agenda. Today. And then it gives us more flexibility. It gives us more flexibility to be able to um, change the contract at the end of the first year uh, either to renew or not to renew and do some of those things in our discussions with contractors. Any other questions? So we're changing it on the fly or are we delaying this two weeks? No, we'll just, we'll just make the change today. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Items 4N through 5E. Councilmember Richens. I have a question on 5A, the grantor agreement in that, the AZ Labs grantor agreement. So, um, there's a 10.9% per, match or something in that, and the council report didn't identify the funding source for that. I'm just kind of curious as to where it was coming from. Is there anyone that can speak to that? Chris? Anyone here from Econ Development? <laughs> Good morning. Hi, Mayor and Council. Um, yes, I think the match um, will be coming from the Economic Investment Fund, which is what's been funding the, the labs piece now. Um, but because it's a, a lower number, we might be able to cover some of it from the general fund, too. And part of the match is in staffing, which is out of the general fund. Okay, thank you. Items 5F through 6C. Items 6D through 7A. And Mr. Brady, I'm aware that we're going to be giving presentations on items 6B and 6D. D, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, oh, here's John. <laughs> Good morning, Vice Mayor and Council. I'm here to uh, give you an update on what's happening with the Elliott Road uh, Tech Corridor zoning overlay. I've got Jay O'Donnell here from Economic Development. It's been a joint process between uh, the uh, Economic Development Office and Planning to, to put this in place. The uh, city is sponsoring a rezoning in this area to uh, provide forward entitlements to facilitate uh, the uh, high tech development of this uh, corridor. So this area is part of the Mesa Gateway Strategic Development Plan area there along Elliott Road uh, from Hawes over to Signal Butte. And we are looking for the opportunity to help improve the entitlements available in that area to facilitate the economic development in that area. 
we know from working with site selectors that they have certain things they look at that really make an area attractive for them to uh, bring these types of industries into. One is to have the infrastructure ready so that it's right there for the industries to use, that the sites are shovel ready, that the entitlement risk is reduced and eliminated if possible, and so we can reduce that time that it takes from the looking at the property and, and purchasing it to getting uh, set up and actually operating on the site. So that's what we're trying to do is help uh, complete that package in the area. When we look at the infrastructure that's available along this Elliott piece of Elliott Road, we see that uh, all of the infrastructure is there. We've got the water, the sewer, the fiber optics, and the electric capability for these types of companies uh, to move in. And so the other piece that's missing uh, is the entitlements to make sure that that's ready. Our general plan uh, for the area has designated it for employment type uses for many years. And the Mesa Gateway Strategic Development Plan also looks at this area uh, along Elliott Road for uh, non-residential uses, uh, largely because of the overflights uh, from the airport, and includes some images about the types of, of industry that we'd like to see <coughs> in that particular area. So focusing in, again, specifically on the area we're talking about providing uh, the uh, zoning overlay for, uh, it's that area north of Elliott Road from Haas over to Signal Butte. And by putting this in place, we'll be able to expedite that entitlement process and cut that entitlement risk for any companies that uh, fall into the category and would like to use this property. We're also establishing some development guidelines that go with that to uh, really target the development towards what we'd like to see in the area of those high-tech uh, type companies and provide some comfort to the residential areas to the north that uh, things that would go in there would be compatible uh, with that particular area. So with the rezoning that's being proposed and the development agreement that goes with it, again, it places an emphasis on those high-tech employment type uses. It specifically eliminates uses that aren't consistent with that type of corridor that we would like to uh, create in that area. It limits uh, some of the retail uses to those that are just really compatible uh, with the, that tech corridor and fit in nicely and round those things out. Again, restricts certain types of uses, provides some architectural design standards and guidelines so we know we get uh, high-quality buildings that would be constructed in the area. Also provides some landscaping guidelines. For the north, uh, 600 feet of the area, it, which would be the area closest to the residential, it limits the height to what the LI zoning district is anyway, 50 feet. But once we get south of that, it allows the height to go up to 150 feet. So that as we move away from that residential area, we can get uh, some multi-story buildings if those can be attracted to the area. In terms of implementation, as a city-sponsored rezoning, if this is approved by council, it will not be automatically applied to the land, but it will be floating out there and individual property owners can opt in to having the zoning then apply to the land. So the individual property owners still have an option. They can develop under whatever the existing zoning is on the property. They could choose to rezone to something else. But if they get that opportunity with the, with the type of high-tech companies we're trying to bring to that area and have been expressing a lot of interest in the area, if they get interested uh, in their land, all they would have to do is opt in to the zoning, also sign the development agreement in the Prop 207 waiver, and then the zoning would be applied to their property. From that point, their entitlement uh, uh, process would be done. They'd be going through staff on their site plan uh, review and design review board for uh, review of the, the aesthetics of the process, but there would be no more public hearings uh, for them to have to go through. So again, it cuts their time uh, significantly in order to uh, move forward with the project. So that's a quick overview of the proposal for this area. I would welcome any questions that you may have. Any questions? Just <coughs> Mayor, Council. Council, oh. Council Member Richens. Go ahead. Um, and it's, it's just heard a lot of frustration from people going through the development process lately, and it seems like we've fallen back into old habits of, of regulating, not facilitating, when we've been trying to get across the notion of facilitating, not regulating. And I just hope that if, if we give this much leeway in a process, that we fall into the mode that we got to facilitate these applications to keep them moving on because it seems I just keep getting persistent reports that um, we we just get are really nitpicky and people don't feel like they have any recourse because we're taking these processes out of council purview and making them more streamlined so that the, the the staff can turn them over quicker but then you know if they get caught up in that process they feel like they have nowhere to turn so um, I'm not sure if we have it figured out on the other ones we've turned loose like this. And so this, this one makes me a little nervous um, because it's a city action and we're not you know, doing this necessarily in concert with property owners. So I, I, I think we need to tread carefully. I know that there's been outreach, and, right. and, and, and but what makes me nervous is that mm -hmm. this is, is a bureaucratic approach saying you know, that we're regulating this and, and you have to conform to us now and they don't feel like they have much recourse back to the city council in the process. So 
So, Mayor Council, um, I think this is an opt-in provision. So it's not something that um, it's 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 not the underlying entitlement as it exists today. So it gives the option for the property owners, which we've met with. Yeah, um, they're afraid to opt in because because we're getting a little bit regulatory in in our approach. So you know, I've heard this concerning Fiesta and 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 downtown and okay. people talking about doing stuff and. So it just we got to yeah. be careful. Okay, that's fair. I think that we were actually using taking this model is what we've used out at the um, the gateway, not the gateway. The um, what do we call that plan? The um, the master plan around yeah. DMB, right. where they can opt in and have the zoning in place ahead of time. The trade-off is it is it's qualitative development that we're looking for as part of the flexibility of the zoning. Um, that we're allowing and it seems to work pretty well and that's what I think a lot we're asking for or others were asking for is that flexibility to have that in place early on uh, which allowed us to move quickly with um, first solar and then Apple and and I think that's helped us to expedite some of those other developments now I don't know that we've created the same type of tool in other locations in the city okay and our hope is actually is that as we look around I think we're there's some other things, maybe form-based code, other things. That the, but this is actually, I think, a little bit different, and maybe John can explain that, because this is where we've created the ability to be um, very expeditious, and it's allowed us to move some of these projects along pretty quickly. So. I, I, I think the key thing here is cascading the philosophy through economic development and planning that we facilitate, not regulate. That's been our mantra for six years since we've been on council. And it just seems to me that there's slippage in that, that there's folks on your staff that, hey, it's like I'm the, re I'm the regulator, it doesn't go anywhere but me, and, and I can force people to do things. And, and so we just need to have a staff meeting and say, guys, we are facilitating people to be successful in the city of Mesa. That's what we're about, is helping people become successful. And so I just think it's time for a little bit of adjustment there or, and reinforcing the council policy uh, on, on that approach. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I, I would just caution that I don't know what the specifics are for each of those cases, if there's a common thread between them, because I don't know what they are, and, and Council Member Richen's concerns could be very, very valid. But on the other hand, another mantra that we've carried on this council is that if it's, it needs to be good enough for Mesa. So no more building at the low end because they feel that, oh, it's Mesa, we're going to build. If, it's, if you're building it in Scottsdale and Chandler and Tempe, that's the level of development that we insist on having here. So if you bring a high-quality project to the city, then it's going to move through the chain very easily. If you build a low-quality one, you're trying to push something that, that just wouldn't stand the test of time in any other community, you're probably going to come up to some regulatory uh, barriers. So I... I I think it'd probably be worth taking a look at some of those case studies to see is there a common theme, is there a legitimate concern, or is this somebody complaining that they're being required to put up a quality product? Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. That was it. Our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The side of 60 now. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Council, good morning. Um, the, uh, there's a proposal to amend the sign ordinance to uh, expand the area um, being used for street banners. Uh, currently, the ordinance specifies that only the downtown area may be used for this purpose. Uh, the proposal is to expand that to become a citywide program. Um, <clears throat> right now, these are the types of banners that you see. These particular poles, uh, when they were installed in the late 90s, were specifically designed to accommodate banners. That was part of the, the structural uh, program that was intended. And at, the at that particular time, the sign ordinance was expanded so that it authorized this. Pre previous to that, street banners weren't authorized anywhere in the city. <clears throat> um, the, uh, so this is a typical type of program. Uh, there's also been across the street types of banners, so they involve two poles. The ordinance 
uh, would authorize that, but there's been some interest. Um, as you can see from the design of the poles that were installed in the Fiesta area <coughs> with the Southern Avenue uh, redevelopment, uh, that these particular poles were also designed to accommodate banners. You can tell by the grommets that are uh, there on the side there. Um, and they can authorize those particular banners. And there's been interest from some other public institutions, particularly Mesa Community College, which is coming up on its 5th and 50th anniversary. They would like to utilize some of these polls to let the world know that they've been around for 50 years. Um, so there needs to be a modification in the ordinance in order to authorize this. Um, we've, a big part of this for a long time has been that um, most of the street light polls in the city of Mesa we really didn't take into account some of the wind loads and some of the other factors that might go into the structural necessity um, for these particular poles. And so that's one of the reasons why this particular prohibition has been in place in the sign ordinance. Uh, we asked the, uh, the transportation department to take a look at that. What we found is, is there's actually four areas of the city that are currently have street poles that are capable of uh, being used for street banners. In addition to the downtown area, that would include the Fiesta District. There are some poles that were installed at ASU Poly you know, along Innovation Way, as well as in the Eastmark project. So there are other areas that are capable of doing that, where we get a chance to take some of the, the success from the banner program from the downtown and spread those to other areas to kind of celebrate um, some of the successes and some of the things that are going on there and try to create some vibrancy and some urban uh, types of uh, celebration in those particular areas. So, um, Gordon, we have a yes, question. Council members. So, on that map, if we did this as a citywide program, realistically, it would be yeah. yes. just those, just just those, those yeah. four areas <coughs> until new poles that could support right. it. We new poles it. or let's, uh, stru let's okay. uh, structure. So, we're not going to see this massive proliferation of, of of signage in every street corner. Correct. It would be limited to these areas or areas where poles of the city engineers determine that they're capable of handling. Okay. So, I mean, those, those are the areas that I would pick out, plus maybe two more in the future where I'd want to see some poles around uh, maybe the Falcon, Falcon and, uh, yeah, and a mm -hmm. couple of malls. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, um, the, the way the regulation is written, only publicly owned poles may be used. These can be placed on private poles. Uh, the prohibition on the use of electric utility poles remains, so if there's a dual purpose, there are poles being used for uh, electric transmission or distribution, they cannot use that particular pole. We have to confirm the structural integrity through the city engineer first. Uh, installation of this is only through city staff or through a contractual arrangement. Um, the, the program will be administered through a designee of the city manager. Um, there is limitations from a safety standpoint to make sure that these remain at least one feet off the edge of the street or uh, at least 16 feet above the street in the case that we have poles that are that close. Um, the sponsorship on this is, remains capped, and so if there's some sort of event or any type of other activity that may have a sponsorship, that sponsorship logo is limited to only 15% on a one-pole banner or 30% on a two-pole banner. Um, and then we have um, some initial um, ideas about how the application process would work. The designee would be the public information office uh, through Steve Wright. Um, eligibility remains special events or other types of public activities. Um, there, the banner would basically start, talk about the event information, um, dates, locations, names, those things, types of things. Again, their limitation on the, the, any kind of sponsorship would be 15% of the total area. Um, for the most part, the banners would be have a high quality to them. Um, there is an installation and removal fee that goes along with that that's basically cost recovery. Um, uh, the maintenance, if for some reason these <coughs> banners became faded or damaged, they would be removed within four to six days. Um, the dis display time frame, they would have to be up for a minimum of two weeks. But they would basically be up for no more than 30 days, possibly longer if we have approval from the city manager. Uh, there's a minimum application to even start the process, which would be $25. Um, so that's the proposal. Uh, again, this is an amendment to the sign ordinance. Councilmember Kavanaugh. Thank you, Gordon. I want to thank you for bringing this forward. And I think it's, uh, you've approached it in a good, comprehensive way that will provide benefit to the community. As, as you remember, Mayor Giles and I were on the council that, that sponsored and approved the original package that we have for downtown. 
And I think that program with the light poles we have has proved very successful in terms of marketing a whole variety of events in the community. I think one of the very interesting things that everyone in the community noticed is when Benedictine put up its its, uh, its banners on the, on the poles. And I think every other college and university in town saw that and, and uh, was immediately jealous. But the... Uh, um, I'm glad, and I know we, we talked about this several years ago on the design of the streetscape, is to, is to use those kinds of uh, uh, street poles, light poles, in the Fiesta District. And Mesa Community College is really excited about uh, the opportunity to celebrate both uh, their 50th anniversary or special events that are occurring <clears throat> at their center, whether it's their new performing arts center or exhibitions at their art gallery, special things like that. Um, I think there will be other areas in the city that will be uh, there will be great opportunities or venues to celebrate spring training, celebrate things like the Grand Prix swimming events and things like that. Many other communities across the country use these very successfully, and I think the approach that you developed here is a very workable one. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Gordon? Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Sure. The next item on the agenda is item 2A, appointments to the Board of Adjustment, Economic Development Advisory Board, and Historic Preservation Board. Can I get a second? All in favor, vote aye. Aye. Uh, any questions on information pertaining to the job order contracts? Yeah. All right. Moving on to item 4A, acknowledge receipt of minutes of various boards and committees. I, move, I got a motion and a second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Here reports on meetings or conferences attended. Uh, Councilmember Kavanaugh. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'd like to report on two events. Last Friday, we had uh, District 3 uh, uh, coffee with uh, Dr. Ronnie Holmes, from Vice President from Mesa Community College there, and uh, gave uh, a very good presentation outlining for the community the various events that are going to be occurring at the new Performing Arts Center at Mesa Community College about some of the additional work that will be continuing to occur there. Um, and uh, one of the interesting questions that I've received, uh, he answered, uh, if you're driving along the freeway, you wonder what those uh, red things are. They're sticking out the uh, side of the building. <laughs> and uh, those are actually uh, stanchions that were from the original seats in the Harkins theaters. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a, a musical chord or song or anything like that, but it's a, uh, it's a, they incorporated the, uh, the old theater seats into the, into the sides of the building, and, and yes, they are going to be working on uh, larger signage, actually identifying that as a, as a performing arts center. But the, uh, they've already started programs with uh, a series of dance programs. They're going to be doing uh, choir uh, performances, uh, and uh, Hairspray will be the first musical to be presented there in a couple of weeks. And uh, that it was, a, it was a very uh, exciting, I think, a presentation for that for the residents of my district who were there, uh, who uh, promised to help. And I think he scored a few volunteers because there were about a quarter of the audience that we had there were docents at the Mesa Arts Center that <laughs> I think they're going to pick up a second job. The uh, uh, second event I'd like to report on is as, uh, as part of my role with Valley Metro, I went to the, the American Public Transit Association annual conference in Houston several days ago. <clears throat> and one of the... Uh, awardees of recognition at that event was Congressman Ed Pastor, and they singled him out for, particularly for his work in bringing light rail to Mesa, Tempe, and Phoenix. And so it was, uh, it was very nice to see. He and Senator Barbara Boxer were like the two main members of Congress who were recognized for their work in, in public transit. And uh, in the video that they had for, uh, for Congressman Pastor, it was, uh, a lot of it was Mesa. So uh, I thought I reported that it was a very, very nice event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Summers. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Luna and myself accompanied uh, administrators from the fire department and police department here in Mesa, as well as council members and administrators from police and fire uh, from several valley communities to Washington, D.C., to discuss our urban area security initiative grant programs with all of the members uh, or the staffers for the members of our congressional delegation as well as staffers from the Senate and uh, House Homeland Security Department and FEMA. 
Uh, we're concerned about the slippage in our ranking in, in the valley here uh, the last year. We've made this trip two years ago for the same reason and found that there was a data glitch be transmission between the FBI's risk assessment and FEMA, and that moved us down. So we were able to move back up and received another million and a half dollars in grant funding two years ago. Those monies are used to purchase equipment and do training, and the results are in part what you saw the, during the flooding. A lot of that equipment and training went into use uh, during the flooding to help uh, mitigate that disaster. It's also currently being applied to planning for uh, myriad events, including the Super Bowl in downtown Phoenix, some events here, and in Glendale. So it's extremely important that it's a partnership between local government, the state, and, and the federal government. It's important that we have a proper ranking uh, so that we receive our fair share of attention for those, uh, for those dollars and we can get the equipment that's needed to, to keep our community safe. So that's where we were, Councilmember. On that note, they got really excited. We, we met with, uh, with FEMA and Department of Homeland Security and they were really excited when I spoke to how we used uh, some of the equipment for the thousand year flood that we just had recently in, in Councilman Glover's area. So, uh, so they've asked us to go ahead and submit a report detailing those events. So we're gonna be doing that in the next couple of weeks. A lot of images and videos. So we're very excited that we can provide that. Councilmember Richens. Um, Last night, uh, Council Member Kavanaugh, Mayor Giles, and myself attended a leadership forum put on by our neighborhood office in the West Mesa CDC. They brought uh, neighborhood leaders in from across the, I guess just the west side, from across the west side to uh, do some leadership training on how to organize your neighborhood and how to um, get people enthused about uh, having block watches and block parties and stuff. They did a really nice job. Mayor, Mayor Giles did a great introduction to everyone, got everybody uh, enthused about learning about leadership. So nice job, West Mesa CDC, and thanks for the support from the city. Thank you. In District 4, we had a BSN. I'd like to thank all city staff that made that possible, and a special thanks to Lindsay Belenke for all her hard work that she put into it. Uh, next on the agenda is scheduling of meetings and general formation. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, just a reminder, for those uh, on the Public Safety Committee meeting, there will be a meeting of that com That committee will be meeting right after this uh, meeting this morning. Uh, busy Saturday, we have a Household Hazardous Waste Collection event this Saturday, October 18th from 8 a.m. to noon at the East Mesa Service Center. Also, um, Mesa Fire Medical will be celebrating Fire Prevention Month at an event on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Bashes Parking Lot at Baseline in Crisman. We also have Celebrate Mesa uh, will be um, this Saturday um, from five to nine at the Red Mountain Soccer Complex. We invite everybody to come out. It's a great event. It's a free family event. And then also next Monday, we wanna make sure everyone's invited, council especially. Uh, we will be having the ribbon cutting of our Mesa Employee Health and Wellness Center which is located at um, Gilbert and Southern, and that'll be at 10 a.m. on Monday morning. Um, also, um, next, so our next council meeting will be Monday, October 20th. It's also um, Domestic Violence Awareness Day, so we're inviting everyone to wear purple to show, show your support for ending domestic abuse. Also, a reminder to the council on that agenda, or. The, uh, prior to, uh, during, after the study session, as part of the study session, we'll be convening into executive session to discuss the appointment of municipal court judges. You have those in your um, drop box. The mayor just wanted me to um, suggest the council be ready. I think there's six candidates that have been recommended to you uh, by the Judicial Advisory Board, and he'd hope like to uh, see if we could uh, come to consent or begin talking about the finalist or how many you want to interview. That's the purpose of that um, executive session will be coming prepared to begin to discuss the finalist that you would then follow up with an interview after that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Um, next on the agenda is adjournment. Do I have a motion? And second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>